Hey y'all, uh, my name is Sass Linekin. I'm with Resources for Organizing and Social Change, which is the host of these bedtime readings for change. Um, last week, we started the story of Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler, um, and I forgot to record while I was reading. So my lovely son, who you see on the other side of me here, has um, agreed to sit for this so that I could do a recording so that people can be caught up when they um, join future readings. So uh, the way this format works is that I will do a screen share so that you can read along um, if you're somebody who processes better through reading than through listening. Um, and so with no further ado, here we will start our story. Okay. Twenty twenty four. Prodigy is at its essence adaptability and persistent positive obsession. Without persistence, what remains is an enthusiasm of the moment. Without adaptability, what remains may be channeled into destructive fanaticism. Without positive obsession, there is nothing at all. Earthseed, The Books of the Living by Lauren Oya Olamina. All that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Earthseed, the books of the living. Saturday, July 20th, 2024. I had my recurring dream last night. I guess I should have expected it. It comes to me when I struggle when I twist on my own personal hook and try to pretend that nothing unusual is happening. It comes to me when I try to be my father's daughter. Today is our birthday, my 15th and my father's 55th. Tomorrow, I'll try to please him, him and the community and God. So last night, I dreamed a reminder that it's all a lie. I think I need to write a book about the dream because this particular lie bothers me so much. I'm learning to fly, to levitate myself. No one's teaching me. I'm just learning on my own, little by little, dream lesson by dream lesson. Not a very subtle image, but a persistent one. I've had many lessons and I'm better at flying than I used to be. I trust my ability more now, but I'm still afraid. I can't quite control my directions yet. I lean forward toward the doorway. It's a doorway like the one between my room and the hall. It seems to be a long way from me, but I lean toward it, holding my body stiff and tense. I let go of whatever I'm grasping, whatever has kept me from rising or falling so far. And I lean into the air, straining upward, not moving upward, but not quite falling down either. Then I do begin to move as though to slide on the air, drifting a few feet above the floor, caught between terror and joy. I drift toward the doorway, cool pale light glows from it. Then I slide a little to the right and a little more. I can see that I'm gonna miss the door and hit the wall beside it, but I can't stop or turn. I drift away from the door, away from the cool glow into another light. The wall before me is burning. Fire has sprung from nowhere, has eaten in through the wall, has begun to reach toward me, reach for me. The fire spreads, I drift into it. It blazes up around me. I thrash and scramble and try to swim back out of it, grabbing handfuls of air and fire, kicking, burning darkness. Perhaps I awake a little. 
I do sometimes when the fire swallows me. That's bad. When I wake up all the way, I can't get back to sleep. I try, but I've never been able to. This time, I don't wake up all the way. I fade into the second part of the dream, the part that's ordinary and real, the part that did happen years ago when I was little, though at that time it didn't seem to matter. Darkness. Darkness brightening. Stars. Stars casting their cool, pale, glinting light. We couldn't see so many stars when I was little, my stepmother used to say to me. She speaks in Spanish, her own first language. She stands still and small, looking up at the broad sweep of the Milky Way. She and I have gone out after dark to take the washing down from the clothesline. The day has been hot as usual, and we both like the cool darkness of early night. There's no moon, but we can see very well. The sky is full of stars. The neighborhood wall is a massive looming presence nearby. I see it as crouching animal, perhaps about to spring, more threatening than protective. But my stepmother is there and she isn't afraid. I stay close to her. I'm seven years old. I look up at the stars in the deep black sky. Why couldn't you see the stars, I ask her. Everyone can see them. I speak in Spanish too, as she's taught me. It's an intimacy somehow. City lights, she says. Lights, progress, growth. All those things we're too hot and too poor to bother with anymore. She pauses. When I was your age, my mother told me that the stars, the few stars we could see were windows into heaven. Windows for God to look through to keep an eye on us. I believed her for almost a year. My stepmother hands me an armload of my youngest brother's diapers. I take them, walk back toward the house where she has left her big wicker laundry basket and pile the diapers atop the rest of the clothes. The basket is full. I look to see that my stepmother is not watching me and then I let myself fall backward onto the soft mound of stiff, clean clothing. For a moment, the fall is like floating. I lie there looking up at the stars. I pick out some of the constellations and name the stars that make them up. I've learned them from an astronomy book that belonged to my father's mother. I see the sudden light streak of a meteor flashing westward across the sky. I stare after it, hoping to see another. Then my stepmother calls me and I go back to her. There are city lights now, I say to her. They don't hide the stars. She shakes her head. There aren't anywhere near as many as there were. Kids today have no idea what a blaze of light cities used to be. And not that long ago. I'd rather have the stars, I say. The stars are free, she shrugs. I'd rather have the city lights back myself. The sooner the better. But we can afford the stars. Chapter 2. A Gift of God. Messier Unready Fingers. Earthseed, The Books of the Living. Sunday, July 21st, 2024. At least three years ago, my father's God stopped being my God. His church stopped being my church, and yet today, because I'm a coward, I let myself be initiated into that church. I let my father baptize me in all three names of that God who isn't mine anymore. My God has another name. We got up early this morning because we had to go across town to church. Most Sundays, Dad holds church services in our front rooms. He's a Baptist minister, and even though not all of the people who live within our neighborhood walls are Baptists, those who feel the need to go to church are glad to come to us. That way, they don't have to risk going outside where things are so dangerous and crazy. It's bad enough that some people, my father for one, have to go out to work at least once a week. None of us goes out to school anymore. Adults get nervous about kids going outside. But today was special. For today, 
my father made arrangements with another minister, a friend of his who still had a real church building with a real baptistry. Baptistery. <laughs> Dad once had a church just a few blocks outside our wall. He began it before there were so many walls. But after it had been slept in by the homeless, robbed, and vandalized several times, someone poured gasoline in and around it and burned it down. Seven of the homeless people sleeping inside on that last night burned with it. But somehow, Dad's friend, Reverend Robinson, has managed to keep his church from being destroyed. We rode our bikes to it this morning. Me, two of my brothers, four other neighborhood kids who were ready to be baptized, plus my father and some other neighborhood adults riding shotgun. All the adults were armed. That's the rule. Go out in a bunch and go armed. The alternative was to be baptized in the bathtub at home. That would have been cheaper and safer and fine with me. I said so, but no one paid attention to me. To the adults, going outside to a real church was like stepping back into the good old days when there were churches all over the place and too many lights and gasoline was for fueling cars and trucks instead of for torching things. They never miss a chance to relive the good old days or to tell kids how great it's going to be when the country gets back on its feet and good times come back. Yeah. To us kids, most of us, the trip was just an adventure, an excuse to go outside the wall. We would be baptized out of duty or as a kind of insurance, but most of us aren't that much concerned with religion. I am but then I have a different religion. Why take chances, Sylvia Dunn said to me a few days ago. Maybe there's something to all this religion stuff. Her parents thought there was, so she was with us. My brother Keith, who was also with us, didn't share any of my beliefs. He just didn't care. Dad wanted him to be baptized, so what the hell. There wasn't much that Keith did care about, he liked to hang out with his friends and pretend to be grown up, dodge work and dodge school and dodge church. He's only 12, the oldest of my three brothers. I don't like him much, but he's my stepmother's favorite. Three smart, three smart sons and one dumb one, and it's the dumb one that she loves best. Keith looked around more than anyone as we rode. His ambition, if you could call it that, is to get out of the neighborhood and go to Los Angeles. He's never too clear about what he'll do there. He just wants to go to the big city and make big money. According to my father, the big city is a carcass covered with too many maggots. I think he's right, though not all of the maggots are in LA. They're here too. But maggots tend not to be early morning types. We rode past people stretched out, sleeping on the sidewalks and a few just waking up, but they paid no attention to us. I saw at least three people who weren't going to wake up again, ever. One of them was headless. I caught myself looking around for the head. After that, I tried not to look around at all. A woman, young, naked and filthy, stumbled along past us. I got a look at her slack expression and realized that she was dazed or drunk or something. Maybe she had been raped so much that she was crazy. I'd heard stories of that happening. Or maybe she was just high on drugs. The boys in our group almost fell off their bikes staring at her. What wonderful religious thoughts they would be having for quite a while. The naked woman never looked at us. I glanced back after we'd passed her and saw that she had settled down in the weeds against someone else's neighborhood wall. A lot of our ride was along one neighborhood wall after another, some a block long, some two blocks, some five. Up toward the hills, there were walled estates, 
one big house and a lot of shacky little dependencies where the servants lived. We didn't pass anything like that today. In fact, we passed a couple of neighborhoods so poor that their walls were made up of unmortared rocks, chunks of concrete and trash. Then there were the pitiful, unwalled residential areas. A lot of the houses were trashed, burned, vandalized, infested with drunks or druggies or squatted in by homeless families with their filthy, gaunt, half-naked children. Their kids were wide awake and watching us this morning. I feel sorry for the little ones, but the ones my age and older make me nervous. We ride down the middle of the cracked street and the kids come out and stand along the curb to stare at us. They just stand and stare. I think if there were only one or two of us, or if they couldn't see our guns, they might try to pull us down and steal our bikes, our clothes, our shoes, whatever. Then what? Rape? Murder? We could wind up like that naked woman stumbling along, dazed, maybe hurt, sure to attract dangerous attention unless she could steal some clothing. I wish we could have given her something. My stepmother says she and my father stopped to help an injured woman once, and the guys who had injured her jumped out from behind a wall and almost killed them. And we're in Robledo, 20 miles from Los Angeles, and according to Dad, once a rich, green, unwalled little city that he had been eager to abandon when he was a young man. Like Keith, he had wanted to escape the dullness of Robledo for a big city excitement. L.A. was better then, less lethal. He lived there for 21 years. Then, in 2010, his parents were murdered, and he inherited their house. Whoever killed them had robbed the house and smashed up the furniture, but they didn't torch anything. There was no neighborhood wall back then crazy to live without a wall to protect you. Even in Robledo, most of the street poor, squatters, winos, junkies, homeless people in general, are dangerous. They're desperate, or they're crazy, or both. That's enough to make anyone dangerous. Worse for me, they often have things wrong with them. They cut off each other's ears, arms, or legs. They carry untreated diseases and festering wounds. They have no money to spend on water to wash with, so even the unwounded have sores. They don't get enough to eat, so they're malnourished. Or they eat bad food and poison themselves. As I rode, I tried not to look around at them, but I couldn't help seeing, collecting, some of their general misery. I can take a lot of pain without falling apart. I've had to learn to do that. But it was hard today to keep pedaling and keep up with the others when just about everyone I saw made me feel worse and worse. My father glanced back at me every now and then. He tells me, you can beat this thing. You don't have to give in to it. He has always pretended or perhaps believed that my hyperempathy syndrome was something I could shake off and forget about. The sharing isn't real after all. It isn't some magic or ESP that allows me to share the pain or the pleasure of other people. It's delusional. Even I admit that. My brother Keith used to pretend to be hurt just to trick me into sharing his supposed pain. Once he used red ink as fake blood to make me bleed. I was 11 then, and I still bled through the skin when I saw someone else bleeding. I couldn't help doing it and I always worried that it would give me away to people outside the family. I haven't shared bleeding with anyone since I was 12 and got my first period. What a relief that was. I just wish that all the rest of it had gone away too. Keith only tricked me into bleeding that once, and I beat the hell out of him for doing it. I didn't fight much when I was little because it hurt me so. I felt every blow that I struck, just as though I'd hit myself. 
So when I did decide that I had to fight, I set out to hurt the other kid more than kids usually hurt one another. I broke Michael Talcott's arm and Ruben Quint Quintanilla's nose. I knocked out four of Sylvia Dunn's teeth. They all earned what I did to them two or three times over. I got punished every time and I resented it. It was double punishment after all, and my father and stepmother knew it. But knowing didn't stop them. I think they did it to satisfy the other kids' parents. But when I beat up Keith, I knew that Corey or dad or both of them would punish me for it. My poor little brother, after all. So I had to see that my poor little brother paid in advance. What I did to him had to be worthwhile in spite of what they would do to me. It was. We both got it later from dad. Me for hurting a younger kid and Keith for risking putting family business into the street. Dad is big on privacy and family business. There's a whole range of things we never even, oops. There's a whole uh, range of things we never even hint about outside the family. First among these is anything about my mother, my hyper empathy, and how the two are connected. To my father, the whole business is shameful. He's a preacher and a professor and a dean. A first wife who is a drug addict and a daughter who is drug damaged is not something that he wants to boast about. Lucky for me, being the most vulnerable person I know is damn sure not something I want to boast about. I can't do a thing about my hyper empathy, no matter what dad thinks or wants or wishes. I feel what I see others feeling or what I believe they feel. Hyper empathy is what the doctor calls an organic delusional syndrome. Big shit. It hurts. That's all I know. Thanks to Paris, Paris, Kecto, the small pill, the Einstein powder, the particular drug my mother chose to abuse before my birth killed her. I'm crazy. I get a lot of grief that doesn't belong to me and that isn't real, but it hurts. I'm supposed to share pleasure and pain, but there isn't much pleasure around these days. About the only pleasure I've found that I enjoy sharing is sex. I get the guy's good feeling in my own. I almost wish I didn't. I live in a tiny, walled, fishbowl, cul-de-sac community, and I'm the preacher's daughter. There's a real limit to what I can do as far as sex goes. Anyway, my neurotransmitters are scrambled, and they're going to stay scrambled. But I can do okay as long as other people don't know about me. Inside our neighborhood walls, I do fine. Our rides today, though, were hell. Going and coming, they were all the worst things I've ever felt. Shadows and ghosts, twists and jabs of unexpected pain. If I don't look too long at old injuries, they don't hurt me too much. There was a naked little boy whose skin was a mass of big red sores. A man with a huge scab over the stump where his right hand used to be. A little girl, naked, maybe seven years old, with blood running down her bare thighs. A woman with a swollen, bloody, beaten face. I must have seemed jumpy. I glanced around like a bird, not letting my gaze rest on anyone longer than it took me to see that they weren't coming in my direction or aiming anything at me. Dad may have read something of what I was feeling in my expression. I try not to let my face show anything, but he's good at reading me. Sometimes people say I look grim or angry. Better to have them think that than to know the truth. Better to have them think anything than let them know just how easy it is to hurt me. Dad had insisted on fresh, clean, potable water for the baptism. He couldn't afford it, of course. Who could? That was the other reason for the four extra kids. Sylvia Dunn, Hector Quintanilla, Curtis Talcott, and Drew Bader, along with my brothers, Keith and Marcus. The other kids' parents had helped with costs. 
they thought a proper baptism was important enough to spend some money and take some risks. I was the oldest by about two months. Curtis was next. As much as I hated being there, I hated even more that Curtis was there. I care about him more than I want to. I care what he thinks of me. I worry that I'll fall apart in public someday, and he'll see. But not today. By the time we reached the fortress church, my jaw muscles hurt from clinching and unclinching my teeth, and overall, I was exhausted. There were only five or six dozen people at the service, enough to fill up our front rooms at home and look like a big crowd. At the church, though, with its surrounding wall and its security bars and laser wire, and its huge hollowness inside, and its armed guards, the crowd seemed a tiny scattering of people. That was all right. The last thing I wanted was a big audience to maybe trip me up with pain. The baptism went just as planned. They sent us kids off to the bathrooms. Men's, women's, please do not put paper of any kind into toilets. Water for washing and bucket at left. To undress and put on white gowns. When we were ready, Curtis's father took us to an anteroom where we could hear the preaching from the first chapter of St. John and the second chapter of the Acts and wait our turn. My turn came last. I assumed that was my father's idea. First the neighbor, could, neighbor kids, then my brothers, then me. For reasons that don't make a lot of sense to me, dad thinks that I need more humility. I think my particular biological humility or humiliation is more than enough. What the hell? Someone had to be last. I just wish I could have been courageous enough to skip the thing altogether. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Catholics get this stuff over with when they're babies. I wish Baptists did. I almost wish I could believe it was important, the way that a lot of people seem to, the way that my father seems to. Failing that, I wish I didn't care. But I do. The idea of God is much on my mind these days. I've been paying attention to what other people believe, whether they believe, and if so, what kind of God they believe in. Keith says God is just the adult's way of trying to scare you into doing what they want. He doesn't say that around Dad, but he says it. He believes in what he sees, and no matter what's in front of him, he doesn't see much. I suppose Dad would say that about me if he knew what I believe. Maybe he'd be right. But it wouldn't stop me from seeing what I see. A lot of people seem to believe in a big daddy God or a big cop God or a big king God. They believe in a kind of super person. A few believe God is another word for nature. And nature turns out to mean just about anything they happen not to understand or feel in control of. Some say God is a spirit, a force, an ultimate reality. Ask seven people what all of that means, and you'll get seven different answers. So what is God? Just another name for whatever makes you feel special and protected? There's a big early season storm blowing itself out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's bounced around the Gulf, killing people from Florida to Texas and down into Mexico. There are over 700 known dead so far. One hurricane. And how many people has it hurt? How many are going to starve later because of destroyed crops? That's nature. Is it God? Most of the dead are the street poor who have nowhere to go and who don't hear the warnings until it's too late for their feet to take them to safety. Where's safety for them anyway? Is it a sin against God to be poor? We're almost poor ourselves. There are fewer and fewer jobs among us. More of us being born, more kids growing up with nothing to look forward to. One way or another, we'll all be poor someday. The adults say things will get better, but they never have. 
How will God, my father's God, behave toward us when we're poor? Is there a God? If there is, does he, she, it, care about us? Deists like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson believed God was something that made us, then left us on our own. Misguided, Dad said when I asked him about deists. They should have had more faith in what their Bibles told them. I wonder if the people on the Gulf Coast still have faith. People have had faith through horrible disasters before. I read a lot about the kind, that kind of thing. I read a lot, period. My favorite book of the Bible is Job. I think it says more about my father's God in particular and gods in general than anything else that I've ever read. In the book of Job, God says he made everything and he knows everything, so no one has any right to question what he does with any of it. Okay, that works. That Old Testament God doesn't violate the way things are now. But that God sounds a lot like Zeus, a super powerful man playing with his toys the way my youngest brothers plays with his my youngest brothers play with toy soldiers. Bang, bang! Seven toys fall dead. If they're yours, you make the rules. Who cares what the toys think? Wipe out a toy's family, then give it a brand new family. Toy, toy children, like Job's children, are interchangeable. Maybe God is a kind of big kid, playing with his toys. If he is, what difference does it make if 700 people get killed in a hurricane? Or if seven kids go to church and get dipped in a big tank of expensive water? But what if all that is wrong? What if God is something else altogether? Chapter 3 we do not worship God. We perceive and attend God. We learn from God. With forethought and work, we shape God. In the end, we yield to God. We adapt and endure, for we are earth seed, and God is change. Earth seed, the books of the living. Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. One of the astronauts on the latest Mars mission has been killed. Nothing went wrong with her protective suit, and the rest of her team couldn't get her back to the shelter in time to save her. People here in the neighborhood are saying she had no business going to Mars anyway. All that money wasted on another crazy, crazy space trip when so many people here on Earth can't afford water or shelter water, food, or shelter. The cost of water has gone up again, and I heard on the news today that more water peddlers are being killed. Peddlers sell water to squatters and the street poor, and to people who've managed to hold on to their homes, but not to pay their utility bills. Peddlers are being found with their throats cut and their money in their hand trucks stolen. Dad says water now costs several times as much as gasoline, but except for arsonists and the rich, most people have given up buying gasoline. No one I know uses a gas-powered truck, a uh, car, truck, or cycle. Vehicles like that are rusting in driveways and being cannibalized for metal and plastic. It's a lot harder to give up water. Fashion helps. You're supposed to be dirty now. If you're clean, you make a target of yourself. People think you're showing off, trying to be better than they are. Among the younger kids, being clean is a great way to start a fight. Corey won't let us stay dirty here in the neighborhood, but we all have filthy clothing to wear outside the walls. Even inside, my brothers throw dirt on themselves as soon as they get away from the house. It's better than getting beaten up all the time. Tonight, the last big window wall television in the neighborhood went dark for good. We saw the dead astronaut with all of red rocky Mars around her. We saw a dust dry reservoir and three dead water peddlers with their dirty blue armbands and their heads cut halfway off. And we saw whole blocks of boarded up buildings burning in Los Angeles. Of course, 
no one would waste water trying to put such fires out. Then the window went dark. The sound had flickered up and down for months, but the picture has always as promised, like looking through a vast open window. The Yanni's family has made a business of having people in to look through their window. Dad says that kind of unlicensed business isn't legal, but he let us go to watch sometimes because he didn't see any harm in it, and it helped the, Yanni, the Yannises. A lot of small businesses are illegal, even though they don't hurt anyone, and they keep a household or two alive. The Yanni's window is about as old as I am. It covers the long west wall of their living room. They must have had plenty of money back when they bought it. For the past couple of years, though, they've been charging admission, only letting in people from the neighborhood, and selling fruit, fruit juice, acorn bread, or walnuts. Whatever they had too much of in their garden, they found a way to sell. They showed movies from their library and let us watch news and whatever else was broadcast. They couldn't afford to subscribe to any of the new multi-sensory stuff, and their old window couldn't have received most of it anyway. They have no reality vests, no touch rings, and no headsets. Their setup was just a plain, thin-screened window. And we have left now, excuse me, all we have left now are three small, ancient, murky little TV sets scattered around the neighborhood, a couple of computers used for work and radios. Every household still has at least one working radio. A lot of our everyday news is from radio. I wonder what Mrs. Yanni's will do now. Her two sisters have moved in with her, and they're working, so maybe it'll be all right. One is a pharmacist and the other is a nurse. They don't earn much, but Mrs. Yanni's owns the house free and clear. It was her parents' house. All three sisters are widows, and between them, they have 12 kids, all younger than I am. Two years ago, Mr. Yanni's, a dentist, was killed while riding his electric cycle home from the walled guarded clinic where he worked. Mrs. Yannis says he was caught in a crossfire, hit from two directions, then shot once more at close range. His bike was stolen. The police investigated, collected their fee, and couldn't find a thing. People get killed like that all the time. Unless it happens in front of a police station, there are never any witnesses. Saturday, August 3rd, 2024. The dead astronaut is going to be brought back to Earth. She wanted to be buried on Mars. She said that when she realized, she said that when she realized she was dying. She said Mars was the only thing she had wanted all her life and now she would be part of it forever. But the secretary of astronautics says no. He says her body might be a contaminant, idiot. Can he believe that any microorganism living in or on her body would have a prayer of surviving and going native in that cold, thin, lethal ghost of an atmosphere? Maybe he can. Secretaries of astronautics don't have to know much about science. They have to know about politics. Theirs is the youngest cabinet department, and already it's fighting for its life. Christopher Morpeth Donner, one of the men running for president this year, has promised to abolish it if he's elected. My father agrees with Donner. Bread and circuses, my father says when there's space news on the radio. Politicians and big corporations get the bread, and we get the circuses. Space could be our future, I say. I believe that. As far as I'm concerned, space exploration and colonization are among the few things left over, left over from the last century that can help us more than they hurt us. It's hard to get anyone to see that, though, when there's so much suffering going on just outside our walls. Dad just looks at me and shakes his head. You don't understand, he says. 
You don't have any idea what a criminal waste of time and money that so-called space program is. He's going to vote for Donner. He's the only person I know who's going to vote at all. Most people have given up on politicians. After all, politicians have been promising to return us to the glory, wealth, and order of the 20th century ever since I can remember. That's what the space program is about these days, at least for politicians. Hey, we can run a space station, a station on the moon, and soon a colony on Mars. That proves we're still a great, forward-thinking, powerful nation, right? Yeah. Well, we're barely a nation at all anymore, but I'm glad we're still in space. We have to be going someplace other than down the toilet. And I'm sorry that astronaut will be brought back from her own chosen heaven. Her name was Alicia Catalina Godinez Leal. She was a chemist. I intend to remember her. I think she can be a kind of model for me. She spent her life heading for Mars, preparing herself, becoming an astronaut, getting on a Mars crew, going to Mars, beginning to figure out how to terraform Mars, beginning to create sheltered places where people can live and work now. Mars is a rock, cold, empty, almost airless, dead. Yet, it's heaven in a way. We can see it in the night sky, a whole other world. But too nearby, too close within reach of the people who've made such a hell of life here on Earth. Monday, August 12th, 2024. Mrs. Sims shot herself today. Or rather, she shot herself a few days ago and Corey and Dad found her today. Corey went a little crazy for a while afterward. Poor, sanctimonious old Mrs. Sims. She used to sit in our front room church every Sunday, large print Bible in hand, and shout out her responses. Yes, Lord! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Amen! During the rest of the week, she sewed, made baskets, took care of her garden, sold what she could from it, took care of preschool children and talked about everyone who wasn't as holy as she thought she was. She was the only person I've ever known who lived alone. She had a whole big house to herself because she and the wife of her only son hated each other. Her son and his family were poor, but they wouldn't live without her. Too bad. Different people frightened her in some deep, hard, ugly way. She didn't like the Hsu family because they were Chinese and Hispanic, and the older Chinese generation is still Buddhist. She's lived a couple of doors up from them for longer than I've been alive, but they were still from Saturn as far as she was concerned. Idolaters, she would call them. Idolaters? I don't know that word. <laughs> if none of them were around. At least she cared enough about neighborly relations to do her talking about them behind their backs. They brought her peaches and figs and a length of good cotton cloth last month when she was robbed. That robbery was Mrs. Sims' first major tragedy. Three men climbed over the neighborhood wall, cutting through the strands of barbed wire and laser wire on top. Laser wire is terrible stuff. It's so fine and sharp that it slices into the wings or feet of birds who, don't, who either don't see it or see it and try to settle on it. People, though, can always find a way over, under, or through. Everyone brought Mrs. Sims things after the robbery in spite of the way that she is, or was. Food, clothing, money. We took up collections for her at church. The thieves had tied her up and left her, after one of them raped her. An old lady like that. They grabbed all of her food, her jewelry that had once belonged to her mother, her clothes, and worst of all, her supply of cash. It turns out that she kept that, all of it, in a blue plastic mixing bowl high up in her kitchen cabinet. Poor crazy old lady. 
she came to my father crying and carrying on after the robbery because now she couldn't buy the extra food she needed to supplement what she grew. She couldn't pay her utility bills or her upcoming property taxes. She'd be thrown out of her house and onto the street. She would starve. Dad told her over and over that the church would never let that happen. But she didn't believe him. She talked on and on about having to be a beggar now while Dad and Corey tried to reassure her. The funny thing is, she didn't like us either because Dad had gone and married that Mexican woman, Corey Azen. It just isn't that hard to say Corazon, if that's what you choose to call her. Most people just call her Corey or Mrs. Olamina. Corey never let on that she was offended. She and Mrs. Sims were sugary sweet to one another. A little more hypocrisy to keep the peace. Last week, Mrs. Sims' son, his five kids, his wife, her brother, and her brother's three kids all died in a house fire, an arson fire. The son's house had been in an unwalled area north and east of us, closer to the foothills. It wasn't a bad area, but it was poor, naked. One night, someone torched the house. Maybe it was a vengeance fire set by some enemy of a family member, or maybe some crazy just set it for fun. I've heard there's a new illegal drug that makes people want to set fires. Anyway. No one knows who did it to the Sims, Boyer, the Sims slash Boyer families. No one saw anything, of course. And no one got out of the house. Odd that. Eleven people. And no one got out. So, about three days ago, Mrs. Sims shot herself. Dad said he'd heard from the cops that it was about three days ago. That would have been just two days after she'd heard about her son's death. Dad went to see her this morning because she missed church yesterday. Corey forced, his, forced herself to go along because she thought she should. I wish she hadn't. To me, dead bodies are disgusting. They stink. And if they're old enough, they're maggots. But what the hell? They're dead. They aren't suffering. And if you didn't like them when they were alive, why get so upset about them being dead? Corey gets upset. She jumps on me for sharing pain with the living, but she tries to share it with the dead. I began writing about the I began writing this about Mrs. Sims because she killed herself. That that's what's upset me. She believed, like Dad, that if you kill yourself, you go to hell and burn forever. She believed in a literal acceptance of everything in the Bible. Yet, when things got to be too much for her, she decided to train, trade pain for eternal pain in the hereafter. How could she do that? Did she really believe in anything at all? Was it all hypocrisy? Or maybe she just went crazy because her God was demanding too much of her. She was no Job. In real life, how many people are? Saturday, August 17th, 2024. I can't get Mrs. Sims out of my mind. Somehow, she and her suicide have gotten tangled up with the astronaut and her death and her expulsion from heaven. I need to write about what I believe. I need to begin to put together the scattered verses that I've been writing about God since I was 12. Most of them aren't much good. They say what I need to say, but they don't say it very well. A few are the way they should be. They press on, they press on me too, like two deaths. I try to hide in all the work there is to do here for the household for my father's church, and for the school Corey keeps to teach the neighborhood kids. The truth is, I don't care about any of those things, but
but they keep me busy and they make me tired and most of the time I sleep without dreaming. And dad beams when people tell him how smart and industrious I am. I love him. He's the best person I know and I care what he thinks. I wish I didn't, but I do. For whatever it's worth, here's what I believe. It took me a lot of time to understand it, then a lot more time with a dictionary and a thesaurus to say it just right, just the way it has to be. In the past year, it's gone through 25 or 30 lumpy, incoherent rewrites. This is the right one, the true one. This is the one I keep coming back to. God is power, infinite, irresistible, inexorable, indifferent, and yet God is pliable, trickster, teacher, chaos, clay. God exists to be shaped. God is change. This is the literal truth. God can't be resisted or stopped, but can be shaped and focused. This means God is not to be prayed to. Prayers only help the person doing the praying, and then only if they strengthen and focus that person's resolve. If they're, used, if they're used that way, they can help us in our only real relationship with God. They help us to shape God and to accept and work with the shapes that God imposes on us. God is power, and in the end, God prevails. But we can rig the game in our own favor if we understand that God exists to be shaped and will be shaped with or without our forethought, with or without our intent. That's what I know. That's some of it anyway. I'm not like Mrs. Sims. I'm not some kind of potential Job, long-suffering, stiff-necked, then at last either humble before an all-knowing, almighty, or destroyed. My God doesn't love me, or hate me, or watch over me, or know me at all, and I feel no love or loyalty to my God. My God just is. Maybe I'll be more like Alicia Leal, the astronaut. Like her, I believe in something that I think my dying, denying, backward-looking people need. I don't have all of it yet. I don't even know how to pass on what I do have. I've got to learn to do that. It scares me how many things I've got to learn. How will I learn them? Is any of this real? Dangerous question. Sometimes I don't know the answer. I doubt myself. I doubt what I think, what I know. I try to forget about it. After all, if it's real, why doesn't anyone else know about it? Everyone knows that change is inevitable. From the second law of thermodynamics to Darwinian evolution, from Buddhism's insistence that nothing is permanent and all suffering results from our delusions and permanence to the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season. Change is part of life, of existence, of the common wisdom. But I don't believe we're dealing with all of that, uh, with all that that means. We haven't even begun to deal with it. We give lip service to acceptance as though acceptance were enough. Then we go on to create super people, super parents, super kings, and queens super cops, to be our gods and to look after us, to stand between us and God. Yet God has been here all along, shaping us and being shaped by us in no particular way, or in too many ways at once, like an amoeba, or like a cancer. Chaos. Even so, why can't I do what others have done? Ignore the obvious. Live a normal life. It's hard enough just to do that in this world. But this thing, this idea, philosophy, new religion, won't let me alone. It won't let me forget it. Won't let me go. Maybe, maybe it's like my sharing. One more weirdness, one more crazy, deep-rooted delusion that I'm stuck with. I'm stuck with it. 
and in time, I'll have to do something about it. In spite of what my father will say or do to me, in spite of the poisonous rottenness outside the wall, where I might be exiled, I'll have to do something about it. That reality scares me to death. And here is where we stopped last week. And so I will stop here and uh, we'll see you for our next reading.